Thanks for watching CBS 8 Plus and welcome to this throwback special. I'm Carlo Cicchetto. With more than 70 years of broadcasting, we've been able to share so much of what makes San Diego the special place it is today. San Diego is known for many things, but our zoo is world famous. It got its start after the 1915 Panama, California exhibition with just a few leftover exhibits. From there, it's grown to the state of the art educational family experience that it is today. We've covered so many of its milestones, so our Marcella Lee is going to walk us through a couple of decades worth of highlights. In the summer of 1954, if you had to go to summer school, this would have been a great option. 271 youngsters, as kids were commonly called back then, ages 10 to 15, enrolled in a free annual summer zoo course. Two hours a week, for six weeks, they learned animal history and other zoological facts. In 1965, a unique project at the ever-expanding San Diego Zoo was nearing completion. It was a $110,000 enclosure area for baboons, gibbons, and siamangs. And as the facilities were expanding at the zoo, so was the population. Baby Nilgais, a baby new, and a three-month-old dromedary camel named Gemini were among the newest residents, along with five sifakas, a rare form of lemur from Madagascar, the first to go on display in a U.S. zoo. In February 1966, the world-famous band The Beach Boys shot their album cover for Pet Sounds at the world-famous San Diego Zoo. These are the only moving images from the photo shoot at the Children's Petting Zoo, a treasure dug up a few years ago that the band was excited to see. And here you see the zoo in its most vibrant form. In December 1966, that's when we introduced color technology. It must have been neat to see the animals in color on the newscast. Pink flamingos, black and white zebras, gazelles, camels, and elephants, oh my. In June 1967, three king penguins arrived from Antarctica. That increased the population to 23. About three feet in height, they're still considered the most colorful of all penguins, with yellow, brown, and orange feathers. The experts say these penguins lost their power to fly about 100 million or so years ago, but they've compensated for it with their superb swimming skills. Zoo leaders started to pursue a new dream in the mid-1960s. It was called by some the zoo of the future. When it opened back in 1972, what was then the Wild Animal Park was focused on saving species from extinction and connecting visitors to nature in a new way. For the people who built the park and for those who worked there, it wasn't as much a job as it was a life mission. The San Diego Wild Animal Park is nine years old and the brainchild of this man, Charles Schroeder, now a retired zoo veterinarian. During his days as an animal doctor at the San Diego Zoo, Schroeder dreamed of building a sort of backcountry zoo. By 1969, the Zoological Society backed him up and the Wild Animal Park was on its way toward becoming reality. We built the area that we're sitting in right here. It was built in one year. And a year previous, we had brought in the white rhinos from Africa, and we had several other animals. We had an overlook down here, and things got really rolling then. The park offers 1,800 acres of land for all kinds of animals, a great many of which are endangered. We hope to establish not many species, but a few species, and reproduce them well, and get into what we call the third and fourth, fifth generations. As director of the San Diego Zoo for 20 years, Schroeder saw the need for a wild animal park as a way to save wildlife, as well as a viable tourist attraction. His dream came true. The dream is uh, better, larger, more extensive than anything that we could have foreseen. In no way could we have forecast anything like this. Schroeder's idea not only materialized, but it's become a model for what's been called the zoo of the future. At 80, after having several careers in the field of veterinary medicine, Schroeder says he's not going to retire. Well, I'm not going to leave. <laughs> it is an armchair safari that spans continents in a matter of moments. Five times a day, Karen Langley leads the five-mile, 50-minute tour across the plains of Africa and the lowlands of Asia, stalking the Bengal tiger or spying the elusive gazelle. Greater Indian rhinoceros are an endangered animal. They are very rare. And this little baby is the second one ever to survive, born in North America. <laughs> Not our best view, but we'll stop here for a moment and get a look. A little armored tank. 
And despite the many times she's made the trek, Karen's fascination with the animals hasn't diminished. I enjoy the animals. I love being out there. They mean a lot to me. And it also means a lot to me to be able to show it to other people and share it with them because this is such an incredible opportunity. The animals are, are out there. Many of them are extinct in the wild. And there, there's a lot of beauty to be shared and just bring people a little closer. A lot of people will never have the opportunity to see these animals in any other means. And this is just a, a very pleasant opportunity and a, and a different viewpoint to see the animals. And I enjoy turning people onto it, allowing them to see it and, and hopefully feel what I feel about the animals at times. It's, it's nice when you can pass your enthusiasm on to them. Karen has worked at the park for two and a half years. She has a biology degree from San Diego State and is working on her master's in animal behavior while holding down a full-time job at the park. Her monorail monologue reflects her interest. She chats easily about mating habits and herding patterns, pointing out well-camouflaged creatures and recalling personal anecdotes about individual park residents. Oh, stepping up into the rocks, there's our greater kudu. Can you see his horns coming out there? Oh, he's stepping away with his spiral horns down by the zebra. These grow the longest horns of all the antelope. He really is pretty. Over a period of time, you get to know the animals individually, you know their behaviors, and you just sort of build up a bit more information. And in doing that, you can sort of build up a repertoire. And then when you're, when you're out there with the animals, you don't know what to expect. When you get out there, you just kind of play it by ear. You'll see an activity or an animal near the fence line or something that's, that's, uh, that can be easily described. You, you tell the people about them as much as you can. You also decide or try and get a feel for the type of audience you have. If you, you try not to be too informative as though you were lecturing someone, but you want to make them aware of the things that are going on with the animals. At the same time, be entertaining and, and make them feel good while they're on the tours. I think you'll agree with me, these are nice Of course, it's hard to tell what will appeal to the public. The children on the trip are sometimes more interested in the ground squirrels trying to freeload a little zoo chow than the exotic beasts from faraway lands. For Karen, the park guide job is as close as she can come right now to her real ambition, a career as a zoo vet. Veterinary school competition is keen, though, and jobs are few. She tries to remain hopeful, but realistic. The monorail may go round and round as it makes the tour of the wild animal park, but the monotony of the trip is overshadowed by the infinite variation of the animal life. And Karen counts herself lucky that she has the best seat in the house on the armchair safari. Carol Kendrick, News 8, The Wild Animal Park. Amazing, and it's grown so much over the years. Of course, the Wild Animal Park changed its name to the San Diego Zoo Safari Park back in 2010. All right, back in the 1970s, the San Diego Zoo had become something of a juggernaut. It was a thing you just had to see, to be sure. In 1978, our Dave Cohen looked behind the scenes into what it took to stay on top of the zoo game. He found out hard work, vision, and a lot of money. The figure this year is $21 million. That includes the Wild Animal Park in the San Pasquale Valley, but the bulk of the expense comes at the zoo. As in most cases, our greatest expense is labor, but uh, we do have, of course, a lot of capital investment. Uh, we are constantly trying to rebuild and update our exhibits, build new exhibits, uh, and with construction costs the way they are these days, that's a very expensive proposition. Five years ago, the budget was 13 to 14 million. Most of the increase can be blamed on inflation. The zoo is a private nonprofit operation, but still manages to generate most of the money it needs. That comes from attendance, it comes from membership fees, from the money that we make on gift shop sales, merchandising, uh, from the bus operation, and of course at the uh, park would be the monorail uh, for the Sky Fire here at the zoo. That's f and then of course we do get uh, donations from people who are interested in seeing the zoo develop further. The zoo raised its admission price from two to three dollars last January, but no further increases are planned unless inflation rears up on its hind legs again. Putting a price tag on animals is difficult. The zoo acquires most of its stock through trades. We spend uh, several hundred thousand dollars a year just in cash outlay, uh, besides the trades that we uh, make uh, in trying to keep uh, and get newer species uh, and actually keep our species in, in better shape. We're trying to build large enough groups to where we can have a population that's self-sustaining. Swanson hopes the long-range program will become reality within the next 15 years. 
If, if you think your annual food budget is outrageous, believe me, it's nothing compared to the zoos, try $325,000 a year, plus another $275,000 for the wild animal park. Groceries for the 3,000 animals include fruits, vegetables, meats, special supplements, and special mixtures. Seldom exotic, but costly nonetheless. For example, it costs $515 a month to feed the flamingos their required diet of shrimp, salmon, dog food, and paprika. The Galapagos tortoises dine on lettuce, barley, tomatoes, and apples, $450 worth a month. The great apes eat like sparrows by comparison, only $321 worth of carrots, sweet potatoes, apples, lettuce, and of course, bananas. Is there any kind of animal species that you don't have that you would like to get that you're oh, yes. working on right now? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> we would love to have the giant panda. I think we probably would have to go through the State Department, uh, at least through the governmental agencies to do it, uh, because the the determination of whether or not you receive the pandas is so political that I'm sure that it would have to go through a governmental case. And tar as far as cost is concerned, um, we would like to help the red Chinese in some areas that they, with animals that they don't have. And we would uh, hopefully be able to exchange with them something that they don't have and would like to have uh, for the giant panda. Swanson has made no formal overtures to the Chinese. Although it's safe to say he's made some inquiries, there is no pandemonium at the zoo. But there is concern for the animals and the people who visit. The staff, 750 during the summer, is well-trained and courteous, the grounds well-kept. The zoo has a reputation its people are proud of. And we not only want to maintain it, we want to earn it. I think it's important that we make every effort so that when someone comes here and says, I. I've heard what a great zoo that San Diego is. When they walk out of here, they're still saying the same thing. Dave Cohen, News 8, San Diego Zoo. They didn't have the pandas yet, but you could see the wheels were turning. Everyone loves a baby, and baby animals maybe even more. Back in 1978, the zoo nursery was a place to just overdose on cuteness, but it played a vital role in boosting the park's population. Our Carol Kendrick talked to a surrogate mother to some young spider monkeys and orangutans and learned about their care. It's always feeding time at the zoo nursery. No sooner does Joanne Thomas serve the spider monkeys a mid-morning snack than the twin orangutans make their demands for attention abundantly clear. The nursery is full to overflowing with baby animals, and Joanne is the only mother most have ever known. Usually if the mother can't take care of the baby, uh, has a past history of killing it or not being a good mother, if the mother or baby is sick, if at all possible, they'll treat the mother with, while she has the baby with her, but if it for any reason would be detrimental to the baby's health, then of course they bring the baby down here. Uh, that is the only type of babies that we get that are either abandoned or, or sick. Little Sarah Elizabeth is a second generation nursery guest. Her mother was one of Joanne's charges as well. And in more than 11 years tending zoo babies, Joanne has bottled and diapered, watched and worried over newborns from all reaches of the animal kingdom. Um, I like the primates, um, the, the new babies. I like the marsupials, too. I like to watch them uh, develop. But I, I think I kind of like all of them. They're all cute when they're little. <laughs> Joanne is playing mother to more animals than usual this spring. Five apes, two monkeys, and four cotamundis. She gives each a name and each a healthy dose of love. And suddenly, an unexpected arrival. A day-old baby lemur, rejected by its mother, gets the ministrations of weigh-in and bath, food, and the cozy corner of an incubator just to let him know that someone cares. 24 hours a day, Joanne and her colleagues in the nursery do care. And it's hard not to take a little worry home when you leave at night. Uh, you try not to, uh, but it's, it is impossible. It's just like raising children. It would be an ideal way to raise children. I think less parents would be unhappy with their children if they could leave them after eight hours a day and somebody else take care of them. But you still have the same kind of worries when they're sick and, and worry how they're, how they're doing. The nursery does have a remarkable success rate. About three-fourths of the charges committed to Joanne's watchful eye get a good healthy start into adulthood. You get kind of a sixth thing about it. You, uh, you can tell by their actions or the way they're um, behaving that day, whether they're just moping around. 
I don't usually know what's wrong with them all the time, uh, but I can usually tell when they're not acting normal for themselves. Uh, then I turn it over to the vets and they have to find out what's wrong with them. And though she has been offered similar work with human infants, she says she couldn't stand to be around only the sick. Seeing her tiny charges growing strong and swinging from their playpens does even a surrogate mother's heart proud. Carol Kendrick, News 8, the San Diego Zoo. What a great job, an important one too. A zoo is, of course, designed to keep animals in, but sometimes they just have to get out. There was one longtime resident of the San Diego Zoo who became famous for his escapes, the orangutan known as Ken Allen. His exploits became legend, but he wasn't the only zoo animal who answered the call of the wild to roam free. The last time he was spotted was laying behind the owl. How much trouble can one Cretan goat cause? Cretan as in the Isle of Crete, not Cretan as in stupid. And a wild Cretan goat escaped from its enclosure at the zoo sometime last night. Over or under it. We're not quite sure right now how he got out. Cretan goats are known as escape artists anyway, and this particular one is a regular Harry Houdini. He's broken out several times before. We had a problem with of getting in and out of the enclosure. Nine times out of ten, they come back on their own. But, uh, this male apparently just went over two fences instead of one. The zoo people were worried the goat might run out onto the freeway at 163 and cause an accident. But they waited a couple of hours, hoping it might find its way back in. Finally, they decided to try to shoot him with a tranquilizer gun, or have the police shoot him if that didn't work. They hope not. That's a pretty drastic measure, having to shoot him. Uh, that's true, but it'd be a lot worse if we cause a major accident. Police refused to have anything to do with shooting the goat, so the zookeepers decided to flush him out. Everybody hold their position. Don't move. Is that the police officer? Hold it. He's going to go the freeway. Hold it. Now, show him back. Gentlemen. He did get out on 163 and almost caused a pileup. CHP closed the freeway, the man with the tranquilizer gun tracked him to the Balboa Park archery range. Did you shoot him? Yeah. The tranquilized goat still made it back to the freeway and up the Quint Street ramp before he finally collapsed. Chris Saunders, News 8, The Zoo. If the San Diego Zoo had a jail, Ken Allen might well be in it. Instead, he's more or less under house arrest. Confined to his bedroom, but with a TV and conjugal privileges regarding female orangutans. His bedroom's a little small to have four, all four of them in with him at the same time, so... Doesn't sound much like house arrest. No, no. Ken Allen, Monday, made his third escape from his enclosure even after the zoo spent $5,000 to make it escape-proof. The notorious orang negotiated a temporarily dry moat and in no time was out walking among zoo visitors and posing for pictures. Now more money will have to be spent to keep Ken from wandering. Making the walls smoother, um, straight up and down, taking all the little bumps and ridges out of the wall that he could possibly get a handhold on. The character Dewey Compost on KFMB's Hudson and Bauer show has other ideas for Ken. Put him to work as an undercover agent in the gas lamp quarter. Oh, boy. He'd be a policeman. Nobody would ever notice him down there. They They'd say, hi, Ted. <laughs> they might, you know, think, look, there's, you know, an old lightener. Uh -huh. How about defensive back for the Chargers? Yeah, it <laughs> couldn't hurt. It'd be an easier interview. It's difficult not to have a laugh or four over Ken Allen's antics, but any more of those responsible for his well-being have some very valid concerns because of his strength, because he is a wild animal, even though he was born and raised in captivity, the potential is there to do harm, to hurt somebody badly. So far in his wanderings from captivity, he's never raised a hand in anger or fear. If he ever does, the results could be anything but funny. Since the Sunday breakout by his two girlfriends, Ken Allen has been playing above suspicion. Who is this man, Ken? Ken Allen is an orangutan. Nine-year-old Kumang, seen here, and 25-year-old Jane, who was off exhibit, got away for about a half hour before the zoo had opened. Kumang stayed close, but Jane, after checking out some birds, wandered into an employee lounge area. She sat down at one of the tables and started finishing off a couple of the sodas that were left around and crushed the cans. And With three successful escapes and once caught while trying, Ken Allen is the Houdini around here. 
He's been on TV and radio, in the newspapers, but maybe it's not enough. Some who work at the zoo every day haven't heard of his legend. Almost every day. You haven't heard of Ken Now I just got back from vacation. If that has anything to do with it, I was gone for a month. Unbelievable. Ken Allen's girlfriends escaped using a long-handled squeegee for help scaling walls. Pretty clever, as if they learned from the master himself. There must be some kind of orangutan communication going on here. After five escapes, three by Ken Allen, the zoo figures it's done all it can do to make the exhibit escape-proof. Other zoos don't seem to have the same problem. Other zoos don't have Ken Allen and friends. Ken Allen is an orangutan. Doug McAllister, News 8, The Zoo. This is a sad day at the San Diego Zoo. Uh, at 11.05 today, Ken Allen was put down. He was known as the orangutan escape artist, but he could not escape lymphoma. And uh, his condition had worsened over the last several days. And this morning, uh, the condition warranted uh, uh, the euthanasia of, of Ken Allen. Options for chemotherapy were explored, but at, at this time, the, the therapy was mainly geared towards uh, making Kenny as comfortable as possible. Back in the 1980s, Ken Allen would regularly climb out of his enclosure. I think my favorite story is when Ken got out and people were standing next to him to having their picture taken. And we told Ken to get back in and he got back in. Ken Allen lived at the zoo 29 years, not always in the orangutan habitat, but he did spend his entire life as part of the zoo family. Ken really did give us, uh, did give the director a lot of gray hair. He, he seemed to outsmart um, all of our curatorial staff, all, the, all those, those PhDs that were, went into the design of the cage and you know, the enclosure, and, and Ken would seem to find a way to get out. They say he was dearly loved here and that he will be sorely missed. The great Houdini of the San Diego Zoo is now gone. Ken um, brought great joy to the San Diego Zoo for over 29 years. And the loss of these, this type of animal is, is a, a great loss to a, our organization and, and truly is a sad day for us at the San Diego Zoo. So you may be wondering about the name. Well, Ken Willingham and Ben Allen rescued Ken Allen from a neglectful mother, hence the name. The koalas are and always have been a big attraction at the zoo. The San Diego Zoo was the first outside of Australia to be home to the shy marsupials. Uh, we would see that colony start to grow in 1981 with a group of newcomers. And in 1983, the koalas weren't the only stars of the show when Brooke Shields came to town for a zoo internship. And in 1994, the koala journey went full circle with the San Diego Zoo sending personnel and resources to Australia to help save the threatened koala population from dwindling habitats. Let's start out with Ann Shaw. The koalas will be paired up with the zoo's current contingent of five koalas who've long been a popular attraction at the zoo. The San Diego Zoo, in fact, is the only zoo outside Australia to feature the cuddly little creatures on the endangered species list for many years. They're home free now, but only since last fall has Australia relaxed regulations allowing exportation of the little koalas, seven of which are now bound for the San Diego Zoo. Well, our primary objective is to get a self-sustaining group of koalas here and by bringing in the additional females to pair up with the, the males we currently have, we think we can increase our chances of production and production of our offspring and hopefully that uh, we never have to go back to Australia and ask for additional animals. Beeler says San Diego wants to develop a self-sustaining colony of koalas that can in turn be farmed out to other American zoos. There are other locations in the country that uh, do have the eucalyptus brows and probably would have the capability of it. Uh, they're very popular in San Diego and we're proud to be the only zoo, but uh, if the, the ban is now relaxed, uh, they could get them from Australia, we'd be just as proud to say they came from San Diego by way of Australia. The San Diego Zoo has spent more than $36,000 expanding facilities so the eucalyptus munching koalas will feel right at home. Where's my lunch? And what are all those people looking at? Oh, here comes the girl now. But where's she going? We want our grub. No, folks, this is no Brooke Shields look-alike. The million-dollar teenage model is doing a three-week internship at the San Diego Zoo. 
Brooke loves animals, so when it came time for the seniors at Dwight Englewood High in New Jersey to go off for a month of independent study, Brooke's pal, the zoo's Joan Embry, helped work out a stint here. At a news conference, she talked about her work, at the zoo, that is. You spend most of the time actually preparing their meals because they're very specially prepared. I mean, they don't just get bananas or just anything. They get all different kinds of fruit. Um, and you spend a lot of time cleaning their, you know, where they live. Brook Shields cleaning a cage, preparing animal food? The first day I got in there, they said, all right, here, <laughs> you know, here's a hose. You have to hose down the, you know, the cages or, you know, here's the food. You've got to cut it up for lunch. And it just, I mean, I was put to work immediately, so that eliminated any, any sort of a problem. And people just didn't, you know, they realized that I was an, a student intern and that I was there to help as much as I could. Brooke says she'd like to work more with animals, probably when she retires, though. She does plan to do some campaigning for endangered species. In the more immediate future, it's back to New Jersey soon to prepare a slideshow, written report, and oral presentation on what she learned at the zoo. Lorraine Kimmel, News 8. The koala babies were born in early April and the middle of May. But being marsupials, their early days are spent in their mother's pouches. There they suckle and grow and come out when they're ready. Koala moms will carry their babies in the pouch for six months before we even see a body part pop out of the pouch opening. And then between six and seven months, usually the baby will emerge completely from the pouch and right on mom's tummy. Koala keeper Chris Hamlin and five others from the zoo were recently in Australia to help the Australian Koala Foundation with a koala habitat atlas. So the when finished, it will be a series of maps detailing the locations of koala populations. They're trying to look and see what eucalyptus forest is left for koalas and where those populations of koalas is located at. Hopefully then they'll be able to create a map that's going to save that land from being destructed and from being torn down. 80% of Australian koala territory is privately owned. Urban straw and Australian brush fires earlier this year are seriously threatening koala habitats and the animals themselves. They really need at this point all the help they can get. It's a very serious situation. Koalas are not yet an endangered species, but could become one. San Diego Zoo has hosted Save the Koala Days and loans koalas and keepers to other zoos. Some of the proceeds go back to Australia. We're going to be sending over, I think it's happening right now, a check for $53,000 over to the Australian Koala Foundation um, to help them in their efforts. The zoo's new koalas are a female named Ginny and a male called Kalongaluk. Outside of Australia, San Diego has the most successful koala breeding program with 80 babies born in about 20 years. Doug McAllister, News 8. Sure, the koalas were popular, but the pandas, those were a very big deal. Now, do you remember that they were actually guests before they moved in? In 1987, a couple of trained, yes, trained pandas came from China for a relatively brief visit. They certainly left their mark. About a decade later, pandas came for a much longer stay and would have a presence at the zoo for more than two decades, becoming one of the most iconic and most popular exhibits in the zoo's history. When the bamboo curtain went up on the panda pad this morning, they were there in full view, doing what they do best, being cute. Bossy and Yen Yen had rested most of the weekend. An official Chinese welcome, complete with dignitaries from China, and the pandas were settled into their new home for the next 200 days. They expected a lot of crowds on this first day, and they got them. The people who did see the pandas, many for the first time, were not disappointed. Are pandas as cute as you thought they would be? Yeah, I guess. I just think they're wonderful and very beautiful. These pandas, unlike others that have visited the United States, are trained. This allows animal experts to get closer to them, part of the effort to help save the panda. There are less than a thousand left in the world. Amongst the official greeters today, some Chinese students studying here in San Diego. When we're in San Diego, we enjoy very much uh, being with the San Diego people. Uh, it's a very friendly environment. We learn a lot and having a very good time. And I believe they will have a very good time as we are having a good time seeing them. Now here's the inside tip on the best time to see the pandas. Apparently they are most active early in the morning and late in the afternoon, so plan your trip accordingly. It may not be the biggest show on earth, but undoubtedly it'll be one of the cutest you'll ever see. Lorraine Kimmel, News 8, at the zoo. 
She's got a little face that has melted millions of hearts. The San Diego Zoo's baby panda is 102 days old today. Doctors say she's in good health and progressing well. But she needed a name, so today Americans and Chinese gathered together to give her that name in a formal ceremony, punctuated by red and black and including lots of guests. <laughs> After months of secrecy and much speculation, officials finally revealed her name, Hua Mei. In Chinese, Hua Mei. In English, China, USA. Hua Mei, the product of hard work and research by both countries. And from what we can gather, a name approved by zoo visitors. It's a nice name. I've been watching the panda cam on the internet. And I go in there and, and check it probably two, three times a day. And I was wondering when they were going to name her. We don't own it, and so I feel the name is appropriate. Oh, nice. That's cute. It's very appropriate because if it's, I mean, we obviously are in the U.S. and it's pandas from China, so it's a very appropriate name. The name also appeals to the younger generation. They should get a name for it earlier, and they did, finally. What do you think of Hua Mei as a name? It's really um, good for a panda. I think it's pretty good. Why? Because it <clears throat> it attracts the people. I wouldn't want my name like that, but it would be a good panda. Good? Why? Uh, because I think it's a good panda name. Wah man. Do you like that name? H E O A M E I. Kathy Chen, KFMB News 8. And without them, we wouldn't have Panda Watch. Thank you so much for watching this throwback special. To see more throwbacks like this one on CBS 8 Plus, click on the News tab at the top of the screen. I'm Carla Chiquetto. You stay classy, San Diego.